et que nous pouvons donc euh, prendre la, commencer cette deuxième session de la matinée euh, pour laquelle nous aurons un orateur, Stéphane Valente, que je vais euh, introduire en deux mots très, très rapidement. Euh, Stéphane Valente travaille actuellement, vous le voyez, à Hambourg, euh, auprès de, de grands projets d'instituts travaillant sur des questions de manuscrits, de codicologie, de transmission des textes dans une perspective comparatiste et très large. Et il a été amené à participer à ce grand projet par un parcours académique qui a commencé à Bologne auprès de Lorenzo Tosi, euh, continué à Pise, euh, avec notamment Carlini, et euh, qui, qui a été marqué par la rédaction d'un certain nombre d'articles et d'études et en particulier par deux éditions critiques importantes de textes psychographiques qui qualifient donc tout particulièrement Stefano Valente pour nous parler de, euh, euh, de Pelux si je ne sais pas si on peut parler de, de lexicographie au sens strict avec, avec Pelux dans son onomastique on est dans, nous l'avons déjà entendu ce matin dans un genre peut-être légèrement différent. Et ces travaux, je le rappelle, c'est en 2012 une édition des lexiques platoniciens de Timé le Sophis et du pseudo Didi, mais en 2015 un, un, le lexique anonyme d'un anti-atticiste, mmh. des lexiques un peu plus ouverts d'esprit, un peu moins conventionnels peut-être que des lexiques atticistes stricts. Mais euh, maintenant, euh, c'est Valentin à la parole pour nous parler de jouer avec le classique. Quelques remarques sur les citations littéraires dans la section sur les jeux de l'onomasticum de Pollux. Merci. Merci beaucoup pour cette votre présentation. Euh, merci beaucoup pour l'invitation à participer à cette journée, à cette journée de travail. Euh, je m'excuse que je euh, parlerai en anglais, mais je euh, suis... Euh, euh, je voudrais aussi bien répondre euh, en français si dans, pendant la discussion. Um, so, I will uh, now start. And uh, the two excellent and learned presentations by Renzo Tosi and Stylianos Kranopoulos, we have just heard, allow me to skip introducing Pollux on Masticon as such and also remarking its pivotal role for several aspects of classical studies. In my presentation, I will focus only on few passages of chapter, from chapters 94 to 129 of book 9. As everybody here knows, these chapters represent one of the primary sources for reconstructing games, game practices, and the related vocabulary in the antiquity. I will take as a starting point for my considerations Quotation from, quotations from classical authors still preserved in the version of the Onomasticon that has come down to us. Within these chapters, 
the total amount of quotations from classical inflows is 14. In five cases, only the name of a classical author is mentioned. In the remaining nine cases, at least a verse is quoted in full as evidence for the usage of a word or expression which Pollux comments upon. Furthermore, in two cases, groups of speakers belonging to a dialectal area are mentioned. One of them uh, uh, was mentioned by, um, in the and handout of Renzo. Um, I will come back later uh, on this point uh, during my presentation. Furthermore, in the apparatus fontium of the current standard edition published at the beginning of the 20th century by Erich Bethe, we also find references to other classical authors which we should consider when dealing with quotation in Pollux. In fact, it is important to bear in mind that the version of the Onomasticon we read is a somehow shortened version, <coughs> shortened reworked version, as it is usually the case when we are dealing in ancient Greek lexical and grammatical works. I will consider in this case uh, the Onomasticon as a lexicon, but with, <laughs> with some uh, um, uh, um, uh, with a particular status as a lexicon. We, we, uh, we should always be, uh, bear in mind also, always, uh, also the rhetorical aspect uh, behind the lexicon, mm -hmm. the onomasticon, um, and its composition. Literary quotations and names of ancient authors are one of the first elements which were cut off while shortening the lexicon in the past. Renzo Tosi has already uh, dealt with this problem. Thus, we cannot exclude that a number of literary quotations originally present in this section of the Onomasticon is now lost. The presence of quotations in parallel scholarly traditions may hint at that. At any rate, we cannot also be sure that Pollux might have deliberately excluded literary quotations relating to certain words or expressions he found in his sources. It turns out, when considering two passages taken from the dedicatory epistles, which introduce book three and six, respectively. More generally, these two texts are also crucial for understanding Pollock's attitude towards the composition of the Onomasticon. You can find the Greek text uh, of the two passages in your handout, point one and two. In the prefatory letter to book three, Pollock's remarks, and I translate, while selecting the words used by the authors linguistically approved, I consider sufficient not to introduce any explicit quotation if those who use them are many. Otherwise, when they are few, I selected one among them, the most elegant in his language, just as in the processes when one single trustworthy witness is sufficient instead of many. Similarly, in book six, we read, point two, and I translate, for some words that are of uncertain meaning and usage, I produce the witnesses in order to let you know we use them. Sometimes, the literary work in which the name appears is also mentioned for some other, for some other expressions, I also added the exact quotations. However, I have not followed this <coughs> procedure for each word when there were no need to, in order not to burden the books with superfluous information. Keeping this in mind, we can now look at book nine, and in my following remarks, I will especially consider, um, concentrate, consider the quotation from classical author <laughs> Sine Verbis. Uh, that to say only where the name of the author is um, present. In fact, they turn out to offer an interesting data set for understanding the use and the role the quotations play in this part of the Onomasticon. Let us begin with the opening section, um, with this opening section, chapter tw um, 94. Pollux starts his survey stressing that 
it would be useful to discuss in brief the names of games. Who can follow on A, the Abracheon Onomata Paidion Epidramei, with the intention of explaining what is unclear in them. Parexegumenon tenen autois safeian. I'm very interested to, <laughs> to uh, what um, Stylianos uh, on this point thinks. Uh, but we are we, on, this, on the problem of this verb, par exegumen, mm. particularly interesting and tricky. Uh, but I, I, will, I won't skip, I will let it for the, <laughs> okay. I will let uh, for the discussion <laughs> in case. Mm. The grammarian um, begins by dealing with dice games, a topic that we had already, con that he had already considered in book seven. As usual, in the onomasticon, we find the so-called horizontal structure associated to this term. In this case, some words are, that are semantic related to, to the noun kubos, dice, are adduced in a sort of parenthesis. And this is the point three of the handout. I translate it. Concerning the dice, whereas the verb discubeo and eucubeo, as well as perhaps the adjectives dysbolos and eubolos come, one must know, and so on. This preliminary parenthesis can be explained by referring to a passage in Book 7.4 of your handout. Here, as you can see, Pollux has already introduced three out of four expressions he later mentions in Book 9. By reporting these words, also in Book 9, Pollux intends to remind and to update what he has already presented to the readers. Furthermore, Concerning the word eukubein, to be lucky with the dice, according to the translation of the little Scott Jones, it should be noticed that Erich Beatty mentions in his apparatus, uh, Testimoniorum, a fragment of the Attic comic poet Antis. This fragment is preserved only in the lexicon of Ezekius of Alexandria, to be dated between the 5th and 6th century um, of our hero. You can read the entry this, uh, at the point five in your handout. Here, we read that the verb eucubeo occurs in a place of emphasis, and that, is the, and that it is the equivalent to the current or modern form eubuleo. eubuleo. <laughs> to our knowledge, this is the only literary occurrence of this verb. <coughs> Furthermore, this verb is attested only in Pollux and in Ezekius. As it is well known, Ezekius does not depend on Pollux. Rather, they use some common sources, which lately come back to the huge onomasticon in 95 books, compilated by Pamphilus in the second half of the first century, our year, as um, Renzo told uh, us already on, uh, about Pamphilus. And in, in his turn, Pamphilus collected the results of the Alexandrian scholarship, having the works of Didymus as one of, primary, uh, of his primary sources. We can therefore consider this lexicographic tradition, tradition as the source of both Ezekius and Pollux. However, if we consider the policy of Pollux concerning quotations, uh, we have just seen uh, in point one and two of the handout, it is difficult to tell whether Pollux mentioned Amphis as a literary reference, and if it were so, the citation should have been cut off during the textual transmission of the onomasticon at some point of the transmission, or if Pollux just reported the verb considering its usage self-evident and not having nothing, um, no interest in, quote, in mentioning uh, the usage by Amphis, by this comic poet. It's open. It's a question mm -hmm. still open. But let us read what follows. After this parenthesis, Pollock says, it's point six in your handout, one should know, I translate this passage, that dice, kubos, is called both the object itself, which is thrown, and the hollow in it, or the sign, the impression, the stroke, that indicates the value of the dice thrown, the point. Mm -hmm. I skip the passage concerning the proverb, um, uh, about which uh, Renzo uh, spoke last year here, no? <laughs> and I, I, I know yesterday. <laughs> I, 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 uh, you told me yesterday about this. 
And I, I get to, uh, to the uh, passage um, where Pollux uh, talks about the place to, place to Bolinda, this game, throw, the highest, throw highest at dice, according to the <coughs> translation of the Lydon Scott Jones. And the text reads, they play the so-called of throwing the highest score, uh, place to Bolinda, having attributed to this hole, which we say it was called dice, as ace, a sum of money, a drachma, a stater, a mina, or whatever distributed according to each ace. The player who has surpassed the others in number of aces would get the money staked upon. Anyway, to illustrate this game, Pollux adds what follows, and it is 0.7 in your handle. I translate. In Tamixia's play, Sling, the way of the dice playing is revealed. Furthermore, it is also added that the mina was staked upon the pips, since they stake the mina on each ace. In this case, the text of Pollux only confirms the fact that this dice game was mentioned or even performed in Amipsia's play, as Christian Orr stresses in his commentary. I would like to report some other remarks Christian Orr does regarding this passage, because they are of certain importance for better understanding it you know, in the context of citation. Or suggests, first of all, that the, source, the, that the source beyond this passage should be the Alexandrian scholar Didymus, which Pollux may have indirectly used by a Pamphilus, as we have just seen. He also points out that, the word, that both word trema and naion might come from Amipsia, Amipsia's play itself, being thus a sort of quotation Furthermore, or points out that information contained in a genitive absol absolute might reflect some scene from this play. If this were the case, then we would gather some indirect information not only concerning what happened on that stage in classical Athens, but also how Hellenistic scholars collected information on games in the classical Athens, mm -hmm. and furthermore, how such information finally found its way into an artist's lexicographic work compiled in the age of Commodus. <clears throat> what immediately follows helps us to get even deeper in the working methodology of Pollux. As we have seen, the word trema is a very likely part of the quotation from Amipsia's play. Relating to that, Pollux mentions now two cognate words, point A, in your handout. Those, and I translate, those who play this game among the Dorians got the name of trematictai, and the related verb is trematidze. And this verb is rendering the leader Scott Jones as bet on the pips of dice. Furthermore, the gambling, uh, the gambling houses were called skirateia, because they played the dice mostly in Athens, in Skiron, in the temple of Tatina Skiras. The last part of this passage introduces some new elements which are related to the previous one, not because of lexical affinity, uh, such as trema, trematictai, and trematize, but because they pertain to the same semantic sphere. The, ton the toponym Skiron is mentioned, among others, uh, in Strabo's geography and in an entry of uh, the geographic lexicon of Stephanos of Byzantium. Um, as Fritz Ga Gaia in the, in the Real Encyclopedia notices, Skiron was originally a village in the Attica, later a suburb of Athens. It was famous for the temple of Athena Skiras, associated to the festival called Skiroforia. As Geiger, remark, Geiger remarks, this district was also famous for the population, that is, pro, that to say, prostitutes and gamblers. gamblers. Pollux, uh, in Pollux, the focus lies on the word skirafeia. No literary reference is given here. Nevertheless, if we search some, lexi some other lexicon, we discover that this word was commented upon because of its presence in literary authors. In the lexicon of the Ten Orators by Hyprocration, for instance, um, a lexicon about the second, third century, we read the following entry. You find it 
at point nine of your handout, and I translate it. Skirapeia is the, this word, of course, in Dinarco's speech against Proximus. They call Skirapeia the gambling houses because the gamblers used to stay in Skiros, as Theopompus reveals in the 50th book of his Philippica. In order to un understand how Pollux came to include these words at this very point of, the, of his onomasticon, it is necessary to consider also a passage from Eustachius' commentary on the Odyssey that Erich Bethe properly mentions in his apparatus pontium. Eustachius, uh, Eust uh, while dealing with the verse 107 of uh, the first Rhapsody of the Odyssey, in which Penelope's suitors are portrayed as playing the peso with Pesoi, introduces a long quotation from the treatise on games written by the grammarian Suetonius. You can read the relevant passage in your handout, point number 10. I quote here the translation of Erich Kuller. He who relates this thing, this things, that is Suetonius, also says that those who practice this game were called trematitae. There is a, a, a different uh, reading of this, uh, of this word uh, in, uh, in comparison to Pollux. Deriving from the old tremata in the dice, adducing Sophron's usage of the word in the verse, having dined, it jostled with the dice players. Trematizo, trematizo and that the dice games were practiced not only by the Sicilians, but also by the Athenians, who even gathered in the sanctuaries and played dice, especially in that of the Athena Skiras in Skiro, from which the other gambling houses were also called Skirafe, and hence all sorts of trickery are called Skirafoi because of the neighboring in, um, of the credit neighbor in Skirafeia. Hipponax, why do you feel me tricks? Translation, translate, and, and. The close relationship between Pollux and Suetonius is evident, but also the difference are. Jean Tayarta, last editor of Suetonius, a surviving fragment of the treatise Peripaidion on games, published in Paris 1967, also investigated the relationship between Svetonius and Pollux. And he concludes, and I quote, Pollux n'ayant rien puisé chez Sveton n'est pas un témoin de la tra tradition indirecte du Péripaidion, malgré l'affirmation qu'on va souvent répétant. Furthermore, he stresses also that sans aucun doute C'est donc chez Panfil, tirant lui-même parti de Didim, que Zouetan et Pollu, comme les artistes Dionysius et Pausanias, trouvaient leur pédia réuni et commenté. Concerning the text of the Onomasticon, the passage of Zouetonius, as quoted by Eustachius, allows us to make some further considerations. Having commented, after having commented that word trema, used by Amipsius, Pollux refers to the Dorian usage of the cognate word trematictai. If we compare the text of Eustatius with that of the Apis's lexicographer, it turns out that the dialectal label in Pollux is probably a change introduced by the lexicographer himself, by Pollux himself, in order to skip this quotation from a Sicilian poet who composed his plays mainly using the Doric dialect. Of course, a true ethicist could not consider adequate a Doric poet as a linguistic model uh, for, artis artis for artisism, an artist's composition, and a model uh, to be imitated. And something similar occurs below in the text, that in chapter 120, where Pollock says, and the, the, it's the, uh, the passage that Renzo quoted, that some Doric poets, Inio e Tondorieon Poieton, called Kundalopaictes, who played the game Kundalismos in this way. And in this case, Castle and Austin considered this passage 
as an anonymous fragment from a direct comic poet. Nevertheless, Pollux intended to follow his source also in this case, probably because he wanted to mention the word Skirafeion, gambling house. Just as in Pollux, Eustatius refers that the, game, that the same game was played by the Athenians even in temples. Hence, the antiquarian explanation of the name Skirafeion from the name of the temple. Relating to this, we should also stress that the related quotation from the iambic poet Hipponax is not present in Pollock's text. We can now read. I would tend to suggest that this is, that this is another case of voluntary omission made by the grammarian. The study of these, passage, these few passages from the Onomasticon suggests that Pollock's usually tend to stick to a source text, reworking it. Therefore, it, Pollux therefore did not collect literary quotations by himself to be introduced in the text of the Onomasticon, but he had already found them in the source text he used. Nevertheless, he did not reproduce it uncritically, but rather he reworked it according to his artist's point of view, that is to say, selecting the literary quotations according to his needs and his feeling for the language. This may also be better clarified if we consider a further passage of the Onomasticon concerning the ball games. For reasons of time, I will only deal uh, with a passage concerning the game Urania. You can read the text in your handout at point 11. I translate it. The ball game Urania, the one, in the ball game Urania, the one bending himself backwards throws the ball to the sky. The, other, the others jump and want to catch it before it touches the ground. Also in Homer, in the Phaeacians, seems to have hinted at this game. Whenever one would have thrown the ball against the wall, the number of jumps was calculated. The loser was called donkey and had to do everything he was ordered to do. The winner was called king and gave orders. Pollux alludes to a passage in the, in the Eighth Rhapsody of the Odyssey, in which the poet seemingly referred, according to Pollux, to this particular game. At first sight, it may be intended as a real doubt of the grammarian concerning the meaning of this Homeric passage. <clears throat> and it possibly may also reflect some ancient scholarly discussion of the Homeric uh, mm. passage itself. However, it is necessary, once again, to consider the parallel tradition and the parallel scholarly tradition. For sake of brevity, I will mention here only a scholion on Plato's Theatetus, which probably comes from Suetonius' treatise on games, together with another passage of Eustatius' commentary. This is the point number 12 in your handout. And I translate it. Urania is the throwing of the ball up to the sky. Homer seems to indicate this game in the verses, and there is a long quotation from Homer, and I translate it, and when they had taken in their hands uh, the beautiful bowl of purple, which wise Polybus had made for them, the one would lean backwards and toss it toward the shadowy clouds, and the other would leap up from the earth and skillfully catch it before its feet touched the, grain, the ground again. Now, uh, we we'll read uh, for that in the, in the scholium, and he said, the aporaxis is when they throw the ball, not against the wall, but violently to the ground, so that it is rebounded and springs back. Among those who played these games, the winners were called kings, and what they order uh, to the other should be obeyed. The losers were called donkeys. And it follows a quotation alluding, uh, from Cratinus alluding to a proverb. I will, I will um, get into detail at this point. And uh, I would, um, I concern the mention of Homer in both um, passages. Uh, it's interesting to notice that Pollux inherited the doubt concerning the possible mention of the game Urania in the Odyssey 
from its source. Second, Pollux and the other grammarians who depend from, from, a, from this common source, um, Pamphilus, I would suggest, but it's, it's still open, uh, may have had difficulties in understanding how such games were played and their report is somehow confused. They were just interpreting what they read in their scholarly sources. In this case, we should also consider, related to, uh, to this uh, game, an entry um, of uh, two lexica, um, that is um, Ezekiel and Fotius. You find it on point 13 in your handout. Both depending from Diogenianus, and Diogenianus coming back lately um, to Pamphilus uh, on the Masticon. And in Ezekiel's entry, we also find a literary mention, that's to say the mention of the comic poet Aristophanes, and the relative, relevant passage in the Wasps were collectively identified by August Meinig. Now, um, we have seen up to now uh, only quotations sine verbis in the Onomasticon. Anyway, when studying passages in these chapters in which there are word-for-word -word quotations from classical authors, the picture doesn't change much. For instance, the three-verse quotation from a comedy by Cratinus in chapter 98 and following illustrates the dice game called Plintion. Cratinus is also mentioned in the paramiographic collection of Zenobius in relation to, one, to a proverb. And in general, uh, in general, the explanation of game rules. The study of some literary quotations in chapter book of, in these chapters of book nine of the Onomasticon has shown that Pollux closely relies on his sources, uh, or source of sources, it's difficult to say. Uh, in composing his Onomasticon, Pollux make use of pre-existing scholarly works, Didymus material, both directly and indirectly, through Pamphilus Onomasticon. In the latter work, the artist's lexicographer could find a huge repository. Well, I mean, for instance, Wetonius or Diogenianus or Ezekius, as it results for their use in later scholarly works, such as Eustachius' commentaries, uh, the Platonic Scholiastic Corpus, on the one hand, and the lexical of Ezekius and Photius, on the other hand. Such a compositional methodology may now appear difficult to understand and is some sort quite unscientific. Nevertheless, it was the most common way in which scholarly and scientific works were produced in the Greek world up to the Byzantine age and beyond. However, it should not affect the evaluation of Pollux as a scholar. On the contrary, it should brings up, bring us to trying to better understand his point of view, the point of view of this ethicist. Mm. Pollux conceived his onomasticon as a scholarly work serving as a handy repository of Attic words and expressions to be used in the contemporary literary and rhetorical composition. The lexical items he included were selected according to his own perception of the Attic language of his own age. The process of selection reveals the intellectual activity performed by Pollux in producing his work. In this context, the literary quotations were not added by Pollux himself, but mostly, probably, inherited from his sources. They should be considered as second, if not third or more, hand quotations. Nevertheless, the literary quotation we read in this section of the Onomasticon are of paramount importance, among other things, for recovering the literary reception of games both in the classical age and its understanding some centuries later, provided that the transmitted text of the Onomasticon is properly studied in the light of the lexicographical and scholarly tradition, extending from the Hellenistic up to the Byzantine age. And the scientific output of this ERC pro, um, project uh, are a most welcome addition to in, uh, toward this direction. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
aux états d'information, les divers textes qui confluent ou qui sont attestés à travers Paulus ou d'autres euh, lexiques. Et merci aussi de nous, de nous avoir laissé le temps de la discussion. Alors, à qui puis-je donner la parole Oui, bien en français. Tu veux penser quand tu veux. Je <rire> peux attendre que je parle avec toi. C'est très intéressant. Merci beaucoup. Je pense que et un point très intéressant et quand tu as parlé de, 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 de le rapport entre Paulus euh, et la tradition de Fantine et je pense qu'il qu y a euh, le problème des, des, des articles de Ezekius et de, de Protius et mais surtout de Ezekius et le rapport avec Paulus et, et la différence est, est simplement euh, la, le, le fait que, que Zikius est un ordre alphabétique, tandis que Paul est un ordre onomastique. Euh, je pense que euh, l'œuvre de Pamphile était très était encyclopédique. Il était absolument difficile de trouver dans l'ordre de, de, de Pamphile le matériel. Et alors, euh, il y a eu, euh, euh, dans le XIIe siècle, euh, la possibilité d'abréger ou de transformation en un ordre alphabétique. Nous avons des papyrus, des, pap des papyrus, mm -hmm. des papyrus, euh, euh, qui sont, euh, sont euh, pareils à Isaac, mais... Euh, non, non égal, pareil. Et on peut dire que ce papyrus vient de Diogenianus. Alors, peut-être que la différence est que Ezekius dérive de Diogenianus et de cette tradition. Et Pollux, comme souhaitons, prend de, la, de, de Didim ou d'une tradition qui, a été, qui avait été était resté onomastique parce que mm -hmm. je pense que et que pour bon, bon, nous avait un ordre onomastique mm -hmm. pas, pas alphabétique mm -hmm. et dans le texte dans des écus il y a même des articles qui ont, ont, la, qui ont la, une structure complètement onomastique mm -hmm. alors ça c'est un, un peu un problème je ne sais pas euh, Qu'est-ce que tu penses Mais euh, euh, il est très difficile de comprendre ça. It's very difficult to 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 tell uh, how this process of of transformation was was performed uh, from the from such a huge onomastic con to uh, uh, alphabetical order. Like so, yes. And uh, but I think I I I would uh, disagree that it was difficult to find materials in pamphlets. Mm. We do not know how. Uh, the material, the materiality of these books yes, was, yes, and yes. and we do not know how uh, such a such a papyrus roll with Pamphilus text was organized. Uh, if there were sub chapters, if there, there were some some reading aids, uh, that's why I I can understand the the the, um, uh, the need for uh, abridging such a huge mm. compilation uh, for the sake of usage, of better uh, your readability and usage. But if you compare what we, what we read in Athenaeus, it was already mentioned uh, today, we find this sort of uh, cataloging uh, structure. You, you speak very much. I know, I, I, speak, I, talk, I speak with you. <laughs> you know better than me <laughs> what I'm talking about. <laughs> I know, but it's a little difficult to find the material in my dictionary. <laughs> another, another question. Uh, the Cruces uh, yes. in uh, point 12, 
It's Kufalo. It's Kufalo. It's Kufalo. I don't understand why. Because we are, because uh, Kufalo has a, a, a quite interesting policy in putting crooks. Um, sometimes it put it's uh, the crooks. Uh, uh, I don't remember why it put this. Uh, crooks, uh, crooks in this case, probably, probably because the verse doesn't sound, doesn't scan. So, the metric is a, is a collect yes. bonus, a book, a rock, a I, I, a test, a glass. And the uh, honors uh, is uh, exactly because uh, uh, the, the passage of uh, Cratinus is uh, quoted uh, for the proverb uh, honors lures, and uh, honors is a uh, it's quite I, if you want, I, I, have, I have a photo of this page. Of this page of my, 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 no, I, know, I, know. I, I can I can check the the, the apparatus, but I, I don't remember it by used, heart. I used to ask Kufalo. <laughs> Why? That's uh, uh, I, I don't agree with this usage of the, of the crooks. But it's a little strange. Yes. <laughs> Il sait pas s'il faut ajouter la couleur de l'allemand. Je pose une courte question, peut-être en français, à propos de tout le monde. Euh, je suis absolument d'accord que les citations sont second hand, third hand, perhaps, mais est-ce que Paulus jamais prend aussi position vis-à-vis -vis des situations, c'est-à-dire une position critique, parce que vous venez de mentionner qu'il était aussi scientifique. Oui, bien sûr. Euh, sur... Donc, il copie et il... Il, il, co... non, il, il copie, mais, euh, mais avec, euh, avec intelligence. Euh, il, il utilise ses sources, euh, mais euh, il les modifie. Uh, pour cet um, intérêt, uh, pour démontrer uh, quelque chose. Mais l'attitude uh, change dans les bouts uh, um, dits, uh, dans, les, dans les derniers bouts uh, livres, <rire> dans les derniers livres de l'onomasticon. Il prend aussi uh, position. Il dit, uh, il dit uh, uh, this, this, uh, this word uh, doesn't occur nowhere ah. or I do not I, I, I found this word only in this because he is defending himself against critics mm -hmm. but it, it's uh, it's quite tricky this uh, this, uh, this attitude that shows uh, like well that he selects his examples but he selects them critically yes or yes. he adjusts it as or he adjusts it according to, to uh, just just uh, I would say just as I mentioned the Dorian poet some of the Dorian poets you wouldn't like to mention Sotheron use this word because, if you if you like, Frenicus would have killed him. <laughs> oh come on! Mm -hmm. Are you are you really side quoting Sotheron? Isn't that isn't any of the poem? Mm -hmm. So uh, get rid of it <laughs> of mm -hmm. this word. But it is trying to have uh, just a more tolerant attitude toward the language and toward what. Uh, the ethic language or the rhetoric uh, um, ethic language could um, use what an ethicist or a rhetorician could use at the time for his uh, own literary composition. It was, it was also uh, a, a, um, um, a teacher in Athens, so he had some responsibilities also in, in uh, explaining what's right and what's wrong in front of his uh, pupils. And that's why uh, it's, it's quite, uh, quite deep. I, I, I do not know how uh, much materials uh, concerning literary authors he actually introduced uh, in his work and how, how much he inherited from his sources and selected from these sources. It's difficult, it's impossible to, it's, uh, it's no, um, there's, this, there's no solution to this question. It, it's extremely difficult to control if you don't have the direct transmission yes. of the author. Yes, and, uh, and you, can, you can compare, for instance, when you, when you, when you have uh, um, some 
parallel tradition with Suetonius, you can you can say, okay, uh, in this text Homer is quoted both in both author in both uh, in both, mm -hmm. but differently. And mm -hmm. well, what what can we do with it? Mm -hmm. Uh, Gerlach, uh, Gerlach in his uh, book uh, uh, about uh, about the pneumologies, the, 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 the pneumologic traditions, uh, speaks uh, says that uh, all people that uh, copied uh, uh, this uh, instrument had eine Konzeptionalität, mm -hmm. a, a specific intent. <laughs> Eine Konzeptionalität, sehr gut. Konzeptionalität. Okay, question. question de méthodologie. Et pour le rapport avec, je te l'ai demandé, pour le rapport avec la poète comique, qui est une source majeure pour Lux, pour le jeu. Tu penses que la sélection était déjà faite à l'avance, donc Pelux avait déjà ce passage sélectionné, dûment sélectionné chez ses modèles, chez le, donc dans le passage antérieur de la traduction, ou qu'il lisait encore ces textes, ou par, quelques textes parmi ceux qu'il va citer C'était une première question, et après, il est dit que c'était très important. Je pensais que c'était une question aussi internationale, car par exemple, Stas parle de la Cubeia qui était diffusée par Asiclois, parmi les Siciliennes, mais on a les cotables, les cotables, il y a un con, euh, consentement des sources, que c'est un jeu inventé en Sicile. Donc on ne sait pas si, si ce sont des Siciliotes, donc des Grecs siciliens de langue dorique, on retourne aussi toujours sur ce côté du Doric, de la langue Doric, ou si c'était comme pensait Mazarin ou d'autres, pensait que c'était des sicules, donc des indigènes de Sicile, mais à part ça, il y a un lien avec euh, la Sicile et les milliers Doric, et euh, donc euh, ça c'est un, un passage que... Il faut s'interroger quelle est quelle source pour la comédie avec Pollux sur sa table, si c'était déjà une anthologie de comiques où il y avait encore des textes de la, du même Dorian ou de la comédie de la Caille, de la comédie ancienne et du milieu à consulter. Ça, je voulais aussi te, te demander. Oui, c'était ça. Répondons déjà. Oui. Deux questions. Of uh, Athenian comic poet or Sophon or Epicarmus, I wouldn't exclude it. Mm -hmm. um, what I, I doubt is the fact that he consulted and he read, he read uh, comic plays uh, trying to extract words from that and inserting them at the right place in his onomasticon. Um, I would say he, it's more economic to think that he had already such repositories in which he could select more quickly uh, mm -hmm. what he needed. Mm -hmm. I, would no, I would not exclude the possibility that he also uh, inserted words according to his own reading mm -hmm. of poets. I, I, I won't exclude it in total. But the most time we find these uh, interpretations and this, I, I, I would say, why uh, quoting so Amipsias um, in point um, uh, ba -ba -bum, seven of the handout, and uh, uh, this, and probably what he is quoting from Amipsias uh, comes from an exegesis of this comedy, and. I don't know how many times this uh, uh, Pollux have had, when have could have spent in order to write these two lines, uh, reading all the comedy and extrapolating just these these two sentences, or having it in a in a repository in a um, in a source. I, that's that's a question, but I, I <laughs> I'm not sure about that. So c'était la réponse à la deuxième partie de la question de cette. La première. Um, Vous pouvez juste rappeler la, 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 la Sicile et la Dorique. Ah, la, la, la Sicile et la Dorique. Uh, uh, 
here the mention the mention of the of Sicilian uh, of of Sicilian, uh, in Eustasius, uh, uh, I would say if this passage was taken from Sueton, I would uh, ask myself if uh, Sueton said Sicilian because it's just mentioned Sophron, Sophron. And then, uh, okay, someone was, was a Sicilian poet, and then, but not only the Sicilians use the, the play this game, but also the Athenians. And there is a pass, uh, uh, um, so uh, a, um, a trade union uh, to the to the to the to Athens, and then to other um, game playing as a petty and mm. more games. Il y avait une autre question avant de Madame. Because his uh, interest in writing the Onomasticon was lexicographic and uh, not pragmatological, and what, uh, what you mentioned just now by his, the use of his sources, and you're drawing examples from uh, later uh, commentaries, also indicates that uh, the, uh, his, his notion and his use of, uh, of the words and uh, of games treats games as structures and not as performances. Yes. Because yes. performance this is my impression. This is my, this is my impression. We, from Polo, we can get some information about how these games were played in classical Athens, probably. probably. And how they mm -hmm. have been rec uh, received uh, in Alexandria or in the, in the Hellenistic scholarship relating to the uh, classics. Mm -hmm. And then this information has been transformed, received. I don't know, I do not know if Pollux did really understand how these games were played. And, and I do not know if Pollux was interested in transmitting how these games were played. <laughs> Um, it's just uh, probably an antiquarian interest, <laughs> probably. Not mainly because otherwise they would have skipped this information. But I do not know if this, uh, the description of these games uh, have a correspondence, a real correspondence in the real life of Pollux. I cannot, I cannot tell it. Can I? According, only according to this onomasticon. But we need some other sources, uh, let's say archaeology and so on, in order to stress uh, how really these games were played. And if, if, if they re have really been played <laughs> mm -hmm. in the second century of, mm -hmm. uh, of our era. But so I think we will have to conclude that. Well, that's not just a question I wanted to uh, wanted to ask. What uh, what time frame does he refer to? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a problem. Uh, so uh, does he speak of the second century A.D. Uh, his own lifetime, or re does he refer to classical time? So what uh, Greece in the fifth century uh, with B.C. or what? <laughs> we don't. We, we do not know. As it doesn't. It doesn't. As it means on a masticon. I am not aware that is reflecting uh, his own age. Um, in his, this the problem is when he is speaking. Uh, they when he uses the other noon mm -hmm. now uh, or the, the nowadays language. Is he reflecting? the current speak, spoken language, or these categories are still belonging to uh, the sources, that's to say what the sources describe as language, um, is reflecting and try to improve this language and to uh, adapt this language to, the, to his own uh, age. The problem is also that Ethicists lived in their own linguistic <laughs> bubble, <laughs> I would say. 
that's to say, uh, they try to speak a language that doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> or it was an artificial language. Uh, if we, uh, this uh, attitude uh, did exist uh, still in, the, in Byzantium uh, just before the, the, the capture of Constantinople. In the, um, in the Byzantine court, it was still spoken as in 5th century Athen while the Turks were coming to the, into the, were taking Constantinople, <laughs> mm-hmm. but just in the court. Mm-hmm. And other, outside the court, the Greek was another language. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Completely, it has nothing to do with, uh, with the Athenian language. And yeah, that's absolutely. to say, mm-hmm. it was a, a sort of crystal. We have been speaking uh, that no. way, but at least the, they some, of them, some of them were able to write Perfect, almost perfect. Mm-hmm. Thomas Magister. Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, from Manuel, and from Manuel II. Uh, yes, Paleologos could, could they do could. that. Yeah. But uh, um, in fact, it seems to me that it would be, uh, that, that since Pollux is uh, stating what uh, should be, authors did refer to, so that if you were speaking, you Commodus or other people were speaking or writing in his own time, referring to things of the past or to present things, you can express yourself in a proper classic or classicizing way yes. about these things. Yes. Mm-hmm. So that this um, yes. makes a lot of yes. la- different layers, which uh, all the, the different interventions uh, this morning have tried to, to explain mm-hmm. and to, to, to distinguish. And we, we have to be very careful, of course, when we, we read uh, and exploit all these texts. So I'm afraid we have now to be careful not to <laughs> add too much uh, um, uh, delay to to our morning. I know that some people were still willing to to discuss. Maybe you you have a last uh, remark, Sylvanus. Uh, I think it was a good closing. No, let's let's leave it like that, and we will dis- perhaps we will have later the opportunity to discuss. Yeah. Thank you.